We are in a great series called Forgiveness Understood, and today I want to talk about forgiving the person that may seem to be the most difficult person for any of us to forgive. The most difficult person for any of us to forgive. Today, we want to talk about forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself. And to stay with our forgiveness understood, our two letters that start one with F and one with U, uh, we're going to spell yourself, you are S-E-L-F, all right? Yourself. Forgive yourself. How do you forgive yourself when you let yourself down or you believe you let God down or you hurt someone that you love? When you think about it, this can be so difficult because we know that we should not have done the thing that we did. We know that we shouldn't have. And we wish that we could undo it. If you've been alive more than five years, you've done something in your life that you wish you could undo. Now, it could be something as simple as this. One time, uh, I found my dad's golf clubs in the garage. I was a kid, found his golf clubs, found some golf balls, and I was like, I wanna see if I can just launch a golf ball into the woods and the side of my house. So I teed up a golf ball, I got my dad's driver out, you know, and I swung, and I kind of whiffed, and, and I messed it all up, and I set it all up again, and I hit it, wow. And as soon as I hit it, I know I shanked the shot. Like, you know when you hit, if you've ever hit a golf ball before, you know that that thing did not come off the club right, and it went, instead of going that way, it went that way, and it's going right towards my next door neighbor's window. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, as soon as I hit it, I'm like, no, no, no. Psh, shattered his window. I took my dad's golf club. I ran into the garage. I threw it in the bag. I ran around the back of the house, right? In that, I wish I could just undo that thing, that moment. A couple hours later, next door neighbor comes over. I see him, my dad talking. My dad says, hey, boy, you know you're in trouble when your dad don't even use your name. Boy, hey boy, you break the next door neighbor's window? No. You sure you didn't break the next door neighbor's window with a golf ball? Like it's a golf ball in his garage, shattered with, no. You sure you did not hit a golf ball through the next door neighbor's window? I did not, Dad, I did not hit a golf ball through the next door neighbor's window. It's funny because one of the golf, the golf ball that hit through the guy's house was a monogrammed golf ball of mine. <laughs> you know, monogram had my dad's name on it. He's like, I know I didn't hit it. You should. I wish I could, like in that moment, I wish I could now undo the lie that I told for the event. I wish I could undo. Now again, I don't carry that around like it was, it was a kid thing, you know. It wasn't one of those things that totally changed my life and I have so much guilt for it, but I use it as an example. We've all done something that we wish we could undo. Maybe you used words, you said something out of your mouth that you didn't really mean to say. Okay, you meant it, but maybe the way it came out could have been, no. You meant it, you meant it. You just didn't mean for the person to hear it. You didn't mean for it to cause the pain that it caused, but you meant it because you rehearsed saying that in your head like a thousand times. It really wasn't your heart, though, to hurt them. It was just one of those things that you've been dying to say it for a long time, and you did, but now you wish you could take it back. We know what we think about when no one else is around, and sometimes we carry shame because of that. Sometimes we carry guilt. How can I forgive myself after what I did or after who I was in a particular situation? Because I acted in a way that's just not like me. Today, I don't know what you have experienced that has caused you 
to hold your past against you. Maybe, now, listen, if this is your first time to family church, I apologize. This is not a church like any other church. We just, we just talk for real about real stuff. We don't pretend that going into a closet and praying is just magically gonna change everything. We, we do some work spiritually. So maybe you drank too much one night and you did something that you can't undo or you said something that you can't unsay. Maybe it was years ago when you were a teenager in your early 20s and you felt cornered in a very desperate situation and you made what you thought was the right decision at the time, but you've been regretting it ever since. Maybe it was a relationship. Maybe it was a dare. I was one of those guys that if you dared me and then double dog dared me and then double dog dared the cherry on top, like, it was going down. It was going to happen. Like, we were going to do something. I'll tell you a story real quick of a moment I instantly regretted. Uh, if you ever YouTube the uh, videos Instant Karma, this is one of those moments. My friends in class, we had a substitute teacher. Friends in the class were egging me on. Yo, slap so-and-so in the back of the head. And so they were egging me on. Yo, slap this kid. Slap him, slap him, slap him. I think his name was Joe. Slap Joe. Slap Joe in the head. So the teacher turns around, starts writing on the board. I get up, I lick my hand, because now I got to one-up it. I lick my hand, and bow, I hit this kid Joe in the ear from behind, right? Now, that was funny to us. It's bullying and all those things. It's totally wrong, and I'm telling you this story just, I don't even know why I'm telling you this story, but I'm telling you this story anyway, because it's happened. It's my life. This kid Joe was bigger than me, stronger than me, but he was introverted and quiet and he got picked on. But I guess that day, Joe had had enough of being picked on. And in that second, after I slapped Joe, and I'm looking at my friends, <laughs> Joe stood up, made a fist, and hit me so hard in the eye, I can still feel it today. I believe I have a lump behind my eye. He hit me so hard. He hit me so hard. I couldn't see out of that eye for days. I went back to my desk. I put my head down. I was, cry I was crying. I was crying. He hit me so hard. And then now I'm the joke. All my friends are dying laughing at me. I wish I could undo that. The second, but I fell into that peer pressure. I fell into that being egged on to do something that I knew. I knew I shouldn't have done that. I was raised better than that. I was raised to not bully people, but to stand up for the underdog, to be a Christian in school. I was raised that way. But I allowed the pressures of trying to be cool and try to be popular to overtake me. Maybe your situation is very different. Maybe in the name of loving your family, you thought you were doing what's best and you poured yourself into work to provide for your family. I'm gonna be a provider, I'm gonna be successful for my family. And then years went by and you realize that you're disconnected from your kids, you're disconnected from your spouse. And you think to yourself, what did I do? What was all that hard work for? And I don't even know my kids. Why did I do that? See, again, I'm not saying that this is all true. I'm just saying these are those stories that we have in our heads of things that we hold against ourselves. The whole time, the most important thing was right in front of you, yet you poured yourself into something else. And you can't get over the guilt of feeling like you neglected your family. So what do you do when what you did haunts you? When the guilt simply won't go away. I made a statement last week. I said, how, how do you forgive somebody who's already dead? Somebody came up to me at the end of the service and they were like, Pastor Mike, well, I kind of got a different situation like... Someone, 
someone who I think I need to ask for forgiveness has already passed away. How do I get forgiven from someone who's already gone? I said, well, you can't. You can't. Someone who's already gone can't tell you that I forgive you. And, and in fact, they're not worrying about it anymore. They ain't upset at you no more. That junk is done. But what you have to do is forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. How do I forgive myself, especially when I keep doing that same self-destructive behavior that I promised myself I would never do again? I want to talk to you about a guy in the Bible. He's called the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is called by Jesus. Jesus appears to him on the Damascus Road, and he says, I want you to carry the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. To that point in, this, in, in where they live, religion and, and the belief of God was only specific to the Jews, not the Gentiles. So the Gentiles would be like the secular world. He says, I want you to take the message of who I am to the secular world. And Paul is standing there and saying, wait a second, I'm actually killing people who believe in you. Paul has quite the past when it comes to anti-Jesus. He was responsible for the death of Christians. And anyone who did not follow the religious law the way that it, it was written and it was supposed to be, he was an enforcer of the law. So I want to take a few moments and I want to look at what Paul said to his spiritual son, Timothy. Timothy is now in charge of building some of the first churches. Paul has been his mentor, his spiritual father, his leader. And Paul writes a letter to Timothy to say how you need to lead, how you need to run your church. And this is what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Paul says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has given me strength that he considers me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Now, if you look at that, you can feel there's a little bit of shame on the backside of that. He said, I thank God that he's given me strength because I feel weak. Even in writing this, I feel weak. Even in being vulnerable in this moment, I feel weak. And he says, he considers me trustworthy and I really don't know why. I don't know why he's asking me to do this because I really don't qualify for this. But he appointed me to his service. Watch this. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. So he ain't going into great detail, but let's just say he knows he don't qualify for this job. I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy. Do you want to know what mercy feels like or the desire to be shown mercy? And if you've been driving for any length of time, you probably have experienced this. When you're driving down the street, and all of a sudden you see red and blue lights flashing in your rear view mirror, and it's not because the car is going around you, it's because they are pulling you over. In that moment, your heart starts beating a little bit differently, and you're just saying, mercy, mercy, because you know that that could be a $250 or more ticket, you gotta lose some time, gotta go to court, all this kind of nonsense, right? You have this feeling like, just if I could just get out of this, I'll slow down. I swear, if I just get out of this one, I will slow down. I'll wear my seatbelt. I'll stop talking on my cell phone. Whatever it is, right? There's this desire to be shown mercy because you haven't been convicted yet, but you know that you were wrong. 
I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. I love that. That God didn't just give a little grace. He didn't just put a pinch of salt and pepper, right? I mean, he's like, bow. He's like dousing him with grace and mercy. It's being poured out on him abundantly. Someone who has one of the worst pasts in the Bible. He says, yeah, I'm gonna use you. I'm gonna use you. But that makes no sense. Yeah, I know. I use the foolish things to confound the wise. It's amazing how God can take the most broken of things and make the most beautiful masterpieces out of them. He poured his grace out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I love it. I love it. If you think that Jesus Christ came into the world to save church people, you missed it. If you think Jesus Christ came into the world to save people who got it all together, you missed it. <laughs> I don't understand when people think that they joined the church and now they're just better at masking their sin. They learn how to say hallelujah, praise you, Jesus, and do a dance. I've got the answers, but people who are really messed up need to get saved. No, I think you might need to get saved again. Because they may smell like alcohol, but you smell like pride. Your self-righteousness stinks. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Whatever you think someone needs to work on, you probably have 10 things that you should work on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save the people who needed saving. And then he says this, of whom I'm the worst. Now, we know that's not true. We know that's not a true statement. But that's how he feels. And that's what guilt does. And that's what shame does. She says, listen, Christ, and I, I know I'm just the worst, but you're not. You did some bad stuff, but you're not the worst. You're not the worst of the worst of the worst. But, he, but he's carrying that as, as he is. Come on, this is hard, right? He says, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, no, you're not, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. <laughs> I gotta tell you something. I thought I was actually a whole lot more patient than I am, and what brought me to that conclusion is virtual learning from home with my kids. <laughs> Dear God, I've never wanted to beat my kids as much as I've wanted to since virtual learning on the computer. It is the, I'm not prepared for this. I, I, I need to go to school, I need therapy, I need counseling. I'm like, Liam, what's eight plus two? I don't know. <laughs> Bro, two seconds ago, you told me what two plus eight was. <laughs> I'm getting some feedback here. They turned the low end down. You just told me what two plus eight was. I'm asking you, cheat. <laughs> Look back. Two more answers. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, getting all, I'm getting all hot, right? I'm getting all heated up. Like, you just answered this question. And my wife has to be like, honey, would you like a glass of water? No, I'm fine. 
honey, maybe you need to go up and get a glass of water. <laughs> you walk away from the moment. As, <laughs> as impatient as I'm getting, you know, sometimes I think to myself, like, God just has to be so bothered with me. God has to be so annoyed with me that I'm not getting what he's trying to show me and teach me and tell me. And, and I could just, I, I, make, I imagine it, right? He's just like, ah, eight plus two, you know that. No, I don't. I don't know how to lead a church during COVID. I don't know how to move forward. You've been doing this since you were 13. God has immense patience. He doesn't get frustrated with you. How silly, how silly for him to get frustrated when he already knows what you're going to do and say. He already worked out the plan to heal you. He already worked out the plan to save you. He already worked out the plan to get you through every tough moment of your life. He has immense patience. Watch, and he says, he has immense patience with me because I'm a little slow at things. As an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. He said, God's using me as an example. He's taking the worst case scenario and he's saying, if I can do it for him, I can do it for you. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. I love that passage. So let me ask you this, you think you got a past problem? You think you've done something really bad? I mean, this dude was killing people, Christians, in the name of God. So in the name of God, he's killing people who are following the Son of God. And then he's called to preach and raise up that church, the church that he is single-handedly destroying. He's got some guilt. He's got a horrible past. And yet his testimony indicates that he had come to fully trust in God's grace to overcome his past. He fully trusted God's grace. Forgiving yourself is really about understanding God's grace. Forgiving yourself is really about understanding God's grace. The truth is, forgiving yourself is not necessarily even important from a spiritual perspective. You can go to heaven without forgiving yourself. There's not like a commandment to do it. But it's healthy. It makes life easier. There's more joy and freedom if you choose to forgive yourself. It is important in living out the Christian life because if you're holding all of this guilt and shame and pain and hurt against yourself, you're never gonna let anybody else live past their hurt and shame because you're stuck in bondage, you need to be stuck in bondage. Hurting people hurt people. Forgiving yourself of your hangups will keep you living in God's grace. Here's another problem. Those people who, us, who have not forgiven ourselves for something, we then also allow others to hold our past against us. Because we know what we did, so like, and then you live in fear that they know your past. I always had that fear when I started preaching that people from high school were gonna like come to church and be like, how is he up there? I knew who he was in high school. And I had to get to the point where I said, well, am I any different today? Have I gotten any better? Maybe some things have changed, new revelation. We were 18, I am 42. I mean, hey, I had hair then. <laughs> Let me say this, in Christ, our past represents who we were. Even yesterday, you were a different person than you are today. I think we also have this lie. We have this lie, and, and we all live it out. 
that time means something. Time, time really doesn't mean anything, guys. Like, honestly, like, we serve a God who operates outside of time and space. If I did something yesterday and I asked God to forgive me, it's as if I had done it 10 years ago. But in our minds, oh, no, you just did that yesterday. Like, you need, you need time before I trust you and blah, 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 blah. That's, that's the human condition. That's our problem. If it's forgiven, it's forgiven. If it's forgiven, it's forgiven. It doesn't matter the time frame of it. Yeah, but you know what? You just need some time to, like, prove. Tomorrow's promise to no one. I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to live on your anger timeline. That's not fair to anybody. Come on, somebody. In Christ, our past reminds us of what we were in ignorance. This is, this is who I was. I didn't know. I didn't know I could be better. I didn't know that I could be in control of my emotions. Come on, somebody. We, didn't have, we have tools today that we didn't have tools when we were kids. In Christ, our past reflects the greatness of God's mercy. God's mercy is the main theme running through your life. Rather than your past being a reminder of the awful things that you've did, let it be a reminder of how awesome God is. I can look back at the stories of my life at times that my life should have been ended. My life should have been ended. I've had multiple situations that my body had been injured to a point that I should not be here today. But God is so awesome he has a mission, he has a plan that needs to be done. Come on, in your own life, in your own life, accept God's pardon. Accept God's pardon. Accept the fact that you're forgiven. I, I, know, I know that God forgave me, but you know, there's just so many people who just, who, who just what? If it's that important to you, then go make amends. Then go see those people and try to have a conversation. Yeah, and I did, but they won't forgive me. That's not your problem. That's not your problem. I offered the apology. I offered the sorrow. If they choose to keep themselves locked in a prison of unforgiveness, there's nothing you can do about it. Walk away forgiven. <laughs> forgiven. I did what I was supposed to do, and I'm sorry that you don't agree. Come on, somebody. I want you to know this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now listen, the Bible says that to the unsaved there is a conviction. There's a conviction unto salvation but there is no condemnation from God. So if you feel like God is telling you, ah, you're still, you're still messed up, you still haven't been forgiven, that is not the voice of God. That is either your own psyche or it is the voice of the enemy. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But it is not God. God does not remind you of your sin. He reminds you of his son. You got to get that. God will never remind you of your sin. He will always remind you of his son. But that's not my reality. That's not what I feel. Then you don't know God's grace. You know some religious teaching. You were raised in a church that wanted you to keep coming back so you could keep paying your tithe. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to share the insider information. It's like paying penance, right? If we can keep fe people feeling bad about themselves, they'll keep coming back and they'll keep paying their penance. Yeah, that's what Martin Luther fought. That's why we had the Reformation. There was a price paid for your sin. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? I want to share a story with you, an illustration, really. 
When I read this, I said, oh my God, I've lived this. And not so much this exact story, but I've lived this in my life. A little boy is visiting his grandparents, and his grandpa's so proud, presents his, son, his grandson with his first BB gun. He's practicing in the woods, but he could never hit the target with this BB gun. He came back to the grandpa's house, backyard, and he spied out grandpa's prized pet duck. On an impulse, he hasn't hit anything all day, he takes aim, he fires, and he hit the duck right in the head. The duck falls dead. The boy panicked, like me, right? Golf ball through the window. Boy panics desperately. He hits the dead duck in a wood pile, hides the BB gum, gun, only to look up and see that his sister had been watching. <laughs> Sally had seen the whole thing, but she didn't say anything. She said nothing. She gave one of those. <laughs> After lunch that day, Grandpa said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. Sally replies, Grandpa, Johnny told me that he wanted to help in the kitchen today. <laughs> didn't you, Johnny? She softly whispers, remember the duck. <laughs> so Johnny washed the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing. Grandpa said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make dinner. Sally smiled and said, dinner's all taken care of. Johnny wants to do it. <laughs> Again, she leans in. Johnny stayed and made dinner while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, finally he couldn't stand it anymore. He goes up to his grandpa and his grandma and says, I can't handle it anymore. I shot the duck with my BB gun. Grandparents say, we know Johnny. We were standing at the window, saw the whole thing. <laughs> because we love you, we forgive you. We were just wondering how long you were going to let Sally make you her slave. <laughs> Boy, have I lived that in my life. That I let a mistake rule me in fear and allow others to try to manipulate because they got something to hang over your head. That's their problem. And they will have to answer to God one day for that. I'm just throwing that out there. They will have to answer to God one day for that. Blackmail, leverage, trying to use somebody's sin. Think about that. Using somebody's sin to get your way. Who does that sound like? That's an anti-Christ spirit because it wants to undo what Christ did. Christ came that his life might forgive the sinner, not hold the sinner ransom. Jesus says, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son, 317, for God did not send his son to, him to condemn the world, but through his son they might believe. That's the gospel message. It can be the most challenging thing in the world to forgive yourself. So I have a tool for you, and when I feel the most overwhelmed of things in my past, I realize that I need to live a life of praise. Praise. Focus on worship and take your focus off yourself. Because that's really what is happening when you're feeling that anxiousness of the past is that your focus is back on you. What you did, how you messed up. Well, then take the focus off you, put it on God. You cannot change what you've done in the past. You cannot change what you've said. You cannot change what you've done. 
but you can change what you're thinking about. That is the power that you have. You absolutely can change what you are thinking about. Stop it now. Change the channel now. Pull out the remote of your life. You've got the control. Change the channel. Change the channel from the history channel to a channel that's going to bring you joy and peace. Live a life of praise. Here's another one. Find God's purpose for your life. If you made it through these situations and you've done some horrible things, then how can God use those things to change the world for his glory? How can he do it? And how can he do it through you? And I'm going to throw this out there. If not you, who? And if not now, when? If you have a dream that's been in your heart, why are you still waiting to chase after it? If not now, when? So how do I get over it? How do I get over my past? I'm going to throw it out there real simple. Ready? Confess it to Jesus. Confess it to Jesus. Lord, this is what I did. You were there. You saw it. But I need to tell somebody. I need to get off my chest. And I know that you've forgiven me. Help me to walk out this reality every day that I am forgiven. And then let it go. I'm not going to break out into the song, let it go, but let it go, man. <laughs> let that thing go. Let it out. Let yourself out of that prison and let it go. The Bible says that this, that he has forgiven us and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. All means all. And I don't care what other Bible theologians say, well, all doesn't actually mean all. Then it wouldn't have been all. It would have been most or some. All unrighteousness. We are not forgiven because we confessed. Confession to the Lord does not unlock forgiveness. You're forgiven at salvation. What confession does is cleanses your own soul. It cleanses your own soul. It's like when you and your spouse get into a fight. I forgave you when we were arguing. I'm not going to hold it against you, but I still would like to work it out. I still like to talk it out. I still like to talk why you got upset when I said this because I don't want to keep repeating it. That's what confession does. Bring it to the Lord. Confession is healthy to your soul. Let it go. If you've taken it to the Lord, then Jesus has covered it. He's washed it with his blood. I'm going to throw this revelation out to you because a lot of us, after we know we're forgiven, we still let other people bring it up. If God could shut the mouth of lions so that D uh, Daniel was not eaten, he can shut the mouth of your accuser. Come on, somebody. Walk in freedom and victory by forgiving yourself. The second largest commandment in the Bible is love the Lord your God. The second one is love your neighbor as yourself. The reason why we have a lot of problems loving our neighbor is because we haven't dealt with the forgiving ourself part. And so in reality, because we're treating our neighbor so nasty because that's how we treat ourselves. We're actually living it out. Treat yourself. Forgive yourself. Step into the fullness of God's grace. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. I pray, God, that today we were given a few tools to unlock the cage of unforgiveness, that we could step out in full and true forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, today that you're doing that work on our heart you're touching our hearts in a way that we can operate and know your grace for us today. If you're in this room today, 
or watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd like to give that to you today. This is that step in the whole forgiveness, right? If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That just needs to happen once. And we're gonna do that today. If you're here or watching online, you've never had an opportunity to have a fresh start, make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Pray this prayer with us today. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type AMEN in all capital letters right there in the chat room? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point, which talks about the first six days of your walk with Jesus. If you're in the room today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow me the honor to take two seconds and celebrate you? I'm not going to call you out and embarrass you, but would you wave at me and say, hey, that was me. I prayed that prayer today for the first time. Anybody? Yeah, man, I see you. Yeah. I see you. Anybody else real quick? Yeah, man. Awesome. Great. If you are interested, we have that same devotional available right at the Welcome Center just outside the doors. You say, hey, I raised my hand today. They will give you that starting point booklet. And just go through that each day. Read the devotional, answer the questions. It is a great jump start in your walk with the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you today for lives changed and an understanding of forgiveness. Lord, as we leave here today, I thank you that we are blessed. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Love you. Offering baskets are at the doors.